Well, good evening, Edgewater family. Let's all stand up, lift up our voices. With Jesus Christ in our life, we are standing on solid rock. Come on, let's go. Standing on your promise, hidden in Jesus, hope of glory, living inside my life, in my life. Hold to your mercy, seeing what you see, hope of glory, living inside Yeah. 
You're so glad to see him here. Love 
Please pray with me. God, thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to uh, be here together in worship tonight. For, for everything that means, we thank you for the, uh, the physical place that you've blessed us with, that, uh, that this building that has come to mean so much to so many people because of what it represents, uh, because it represents you, because it represents a, a loving, caring community of people. It represents a place where needs can be met. God, we, we thank you for the opportunity to gather here to worship you, because you are the one who is worthy of our worship. You are the one who is worthy of our praise, the one around whom we can build our lives. God, help us to not just kind of sprinkle a little bit of you in a few different areas of our life, but instead to allow you, God, to be the foundation for all of it, to, to be involved in, in every aspect, to be at the center of it. Because God, we know uh, a lot of times by practical experience that when we don't do it that way, we, we run into trouble. Because God, you, you created us, you love us, you have a plan for our lives, you know what's best for us and you want what's best for us. So God, we thank you for that way that you work 
in us. And, and God, I thank you that as we gather here to worship, we get to do it in this, with this community of people. These folks who are uh, just all across the, the journey of faith uh, along the way, some who have been here uh, since, they, since before they could walk, and, and others who, who maybe are just checking it out and everywhere in between. And so, God, I thank you for the way that you meet us uh, in these individual ways. You meet us all along this journey. And that you, uh, you, you, you allow us to, to come into this time of worship um, just the way we are. We don't have to clean ourselves up. We don't have to have every problem in our life taken care of before we can come to you. But God, you love us too much to let us stay that way. That you give us the opportunity, that you call us to move into um, kind of a new, a new reality, a new way to experience life, a new, a new sense of power and love and, and forgiveness in our lives. So God, I pray that you'll continue to help us to step out more and more to experience your fullness in every area of our life, that we can truly live this, this blessed life that comes in, in recognizing uh, what you've done for us, that comes in receiving what you give us with an open hand and, and reflecting it to the people around us, that, that comes from the, the total and complete giving of our hearts to you to be used in your service to other people. So God, as we've gathered here tonight, we've come from uh, all sorts of different things going on in our lives, and, and so we want to take a moment to... Uh, to be in conversation with you, to share what's on our hearts, and we want to do that right now in a moment of silent prayer. God, thank you so much for hearing our prayers, for allowing us to be able to come and, and bring our, our hearts to you, or whatever it is that's going on, and that we have the opportunity to, uh, to hear from you through the music, through the message, through the times of, of quiet, even through the voices of, of those around us. God, help us to recognize and remember how much you do love us. That even before we knew you, you loved us. You sent your son Jesus to come and live a life as an example for us. He came to die on the cross for our sins so we could be restored in relationship with you. And so God, help us then to build some of these Christ-like characteristics into our life. Help us to grow, to get to know you better and better. And one of the ways that we do that is through these times of prayer. And we want to do that uh, corporately now as a group together. As together we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray by praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, it's so good to see all of you gathered here tonight. Uh, thank you so much for coming. My name is Dan Prawn. I'm the pastor here at Edgewater, and uh, just so glad that you're here. Uh, and if this is your first time here tonight, thank you so much for coming. We are so glad that you're here. Uh, we pray that you find this to be a place that you can call home, a place that you can connect with God, connect with other people. Uh, it's, a, it's a great, wonderful uh, group of folks, and I uh, hope you find this to be a home for you. If you are here for the first time tonight, please be sure to take some time to uh, stop by our Welcome Center out there in the center of the lobby. There's information there to help you to get to know our church a little bit better. Uh, if you're here for the first, second, or third time, please take a moment, fill out one of those um, yellow cards you'll find there in the chairs in front of you. Um, those will go in the baskets in just a few moments, so please uh, fill that out if you will. 
Um, take some time to look through the bulletin. Not going to take a whole lot of time on it, but uh, um, as we're getting ready to head into summer, some different things are changing. Some actually, actually, some things are being added on, which is kind of neat. We've got some new ways to connect, and and one of them is a, a new student ministry that's starting this coming Wednesday, June sixth. That's called the Gap, and it's for our uh, fifth and sixth graders that kind of fall between the, the 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 children's ministry and the student ministry, kind of feeling that that little area of well, which way which way do they really fit? Well, we've made something specially for them, so that's going to be starting this uh, this Wednesday evening. You'll see the information there in the bulletin. You also see some other schedule stuff for the uh, the student ministry and for the children's ministry with the Vacation Bible School coming up. So uh, take some time to look through the rest of the bulletin. I encourage you to do that. Um, get some of these things on your calendar. Um, one thing I just want to remind you about, if you have been here over the past couple of weeks, and if you haven't been here over the past couple of weeks, I'll get to share it with you for the first time. Uh, we've been st- uh, studying the blessed life, what it means to, to have a, a life that is blessed by God. And, and we've talked about one of the ways that we do that is, is when we put ourselves in a position uh, um, un- under God to be able to receive what he gives us with open hands, be able to reflect that to those around us, to, to not get everything that we have and hold this grip on it and be in the grip of materialism. And, and so many of us struggle with that in so many ways. And it's hard sometimes to write that tithe check as the first thing, because if you haven't done it before, it's, it's kind of hard to take that, that step. So what we've done to, to give you a, a little uh, added incentive, a little money back guarantee is the opportunity to participate in the three-month tithe challenge. You'll see the cards in the chairs in front of you if you'd like to pick one of those up. What we encourage you to do is, is start tithing. Tithe for, for three months. And if after three months you don't feel that God has blessed you like he promised that he would, then, then we will refund all of the money that you gave during that three-month period. So we had a, a whole other group uh, jump in last week, so we're really excited about that. Uh, we're going to keep these cards in the chairs, so if maybe you're still taking some time to think about it, working out the numbers, um, I, or maybe this is the first time you've heard of it, um, take this out, and if you want to cut off the, the top half, take the top half with you and uh, leave the bottom half here, place it in the offering basket when it comes by. I encourage you to jump on board with that, because I promise you, you will not regret it. So um, please be sure to take note of that. Well, along those lines, the ushers are ready to come through with the uh, baskets. This is the time that we want to uh, bring our tithes and offerings to God uh, uh, as a way of saying thank you to him, as a way of acknowledging that everything that we have, everything that we are belongs to him. So, uh, and, and we get a chance to, to manage it and give back to him a portion of what he's given to us in the first place. So I'm going to ask the ushers now to please come forward to receive the offering this evening. All right, as we get ready to see what uh, God's Word has in store for us tonight, let's take a moment, let's pray together, please. God, thank you so much for this time together this evening. I pray that you will give me the words to say that you want me to say, that you will help us to hear what you want us to hear. You will give us the courage and the strength to act on it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, uh, tonight we're continuing the the series called The Blessed Life, and uh, over these past few weeks, we've been talking about living a blessed life. How, how do you live a life that's blessed by God? What is it about living a life of blessing? We're gonna, we've talked over these past couple of weeks about kind of changing our perspective a, a little bit and, and uh, how, how that impacts us being able to, to go through even difficult times and still be able to recognize the blessing of God in our lives. We, we talked about uh, over the past couple of weeks about um, how we handle our, our resources. And, and we read some scripture that, that was very clear about when, when we give back to God what is His, we will be blessed. And, uh, and, and so we've talked about those resources. In the past two weeks, we kind of focused um, more specifically on um, the financial resources that we have. But, but that's not what we're limited to. That's not exactly the, the sum total of, of what we're made of. Um, and so we're going to be talking a little bit tonight about uh, some other resources that we have, our time. Our talents, our, our abilities, our skills, our, our experiences that we've had in our lives. How, how can we use them to serve others? So, so we're going to be talking about serving God, developing this heart of serving. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of stay in, a, in, a, in a, just a certain area of Scripture that, that uh, maybe watching that video maybe brought that, that story to mind a little bit. Um, it's in John chapter 13. If you have your Bibles with you or, or if you have uh, it on your phone or whatever, turn the volume off and then, and then bring it up And if you want to follow along with us here. But we're going we're gonna to look at this John chapter 13. Now, now this is a moment in Jesus' life where uh, 
He was with His disciples. Okay, these were the people that He had walked with for, for three years up to that point. And uh, this was a very significant time. This was a time, uh, some big things were going to be happening right after uh, this time of gathering with His disciples. He knew it, they, the disciples didn't. And some of the things that happened after this time with His disciples ended up changing the world. And then it's changed and impacted all of our lives, all of us here. And so we're going to start in John chapter 13. And just right off the bat here in verse 1. It says, before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his father. He now showed the disciples the full extent of his love. Okay, now we're going to skip down a second. We're going to look at uh, verses four through eight here. Um, the, The disciples had gathered now and it says, so he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples feet and to wipe them with the towel he had around him. When he came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, why are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you don't understand now why I'm doing it. Someday you will. No, Peter protested. You will never wash my feet. Peter Peter couldn't understand why Jesus was was doing this. That this act that was normally reserved for a a, a servant. Someone of, of a lower station in life. Um... And, and now, so he said, I'm not going to let you do that. But then Jesus continued on and he kind of answered uh, what Peter said in, in verse 8, where he said, uh, Jesus replied, uh, but if I don't wash you, you won't belong to me. So, so almost immediately, Peter changed his tune and said, okay, okay, fine. Then, then, then go right ahead. Let's do this. He wanted to be a part of it. And then Jesus kind of took some time to explain a little bit about what was happening down in verse 12. Where it says, after washing their feet, He put on his robe again and sat down and asked, Do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, because it's true. And since I, the Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I've given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. How true it is that a servant is not greater than the master, nor are messengers more important than the one who sends them. And then here's the key in this next verse right here in verse 17. It says, you know these things, now do them. That is the path of blessing. So, so Jesus, right, right there in that verse, as, as he kind of sums up this, this action that kind of shook his disciples a little bit, as, 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 he, as he kind of sums this up, what does he say? He, he, he talks about the difference between just knowing something and actually taking it and applying it to your life and actually doing it. I like in that video that we saw, it flashed a lot of these things that, that, that reminded us of, of these different commands, these different things that we want to try to incorporate in our lives. And a lot of us probably recognize them, but I think if, some of them, if we went down through the checklist and said, do, do, ooh, do I actually do that? Maybe not so much. We, we, we know a lot of things, but do we actually do them? There is a difference between knowledge and, and application of that knowledge. So, so Jesus was there saying, you know, it, it's great that you know these things. You're, you're aware of this example. You're, you're aware of this heart to, to serve. But it's totally going to change. When you, when you live it out, it's going to take you down a completely different path than you're going down now. You start doing these things, and this will be the path to blessing. There, there are two things that are kind of really interesting about this, this chapter. The first one is kind of the context around which... This, this is happening, okay? So um, at, at this point, Jesus' disciples, uh, as you can imagine, a, a bunch of guys hanging out together day after day for three years. The, the, the relationships go up and down. This was a particular time where the disciples were kind of butting heads a little bit. They, they, were, they were bickering, they were arguing, they were having a hard time getting along. And, and this was Jesus' team, okay? Jesus' small group here. There, there was some jealousy, there was some ego, there was some competition involved. Oh, I'm better. Jesus spends more time with me. You know, he, he talked to me last night after everybody else went to bed. I mean, we were in this ultra high secret level meeting, you know, and you didn't get to go to the meeting. Sorry. You know, you weren't there. So, so there's this whole kind of jockeying for position among the disciples. And eventually they got kind of upset about it. And, and so there was some arguing and some, some bickering and, and, um, and, in the middle of all of this that's happening here in John chapter 13, Jesus walks right kind of into the middle of it. And have you ever been in, in a, walked into a room and you can just, 
and, it, and it's almost like you're walking into this tension. You can feel the tension in the air because of a discussion or whatever that was going on there. And, and, and you kind of feel like just going, wow, okay, what, what's happening in here? Getting a bad, bad vibe through all of this. Did I, did I miss something? It's almost like Jesus walked right into that kind of room, that kind of experience. Now the thing was, as the disciples were all gathering for uh, this, this Passover meal, they had kind of all come in, they, they had this room to themselves, they didn't have the, the servants. A lot of times what would happen is servants would be there to help wash the feet of people who came in, but the basin and the towel were sitting there right by the door, and every single one of them just walked right past it. They came in the room, they had all walked by it. And so even though it was, it was something cultural to, to, to do that, I mean they had been out walking around all day, they had dirty feet, and but but uh, if there was no one there hosting the meal, and so there was no servant, and so no one had taken the time to do this. And so as they were walking in, they were probably all thinking, well, I'm not going to be the one. And so, so they're jockeying for this position to try to get to the top, and, and so no one wants to willingly take that spot at the bottom. They, they had all walked by this, oh, I'm not going to be the one to, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not washing Thomas's feet. Dude, he doubts all the time. I'm not going to, he See, I'm not, I'm not going to do any of that. Let, let some of those disciples that nobody knows their names, let, let them do it. Thaddeus, Bartholomew, he didn't even get a book in the New Testament. Come on, let, make, make him do the, do the feet. He's not even going to make the big list here. So, um, so, so Jesus walks in, and, and I, can, I, can picture, I can picture the room. I can picture these little discussions and people kind of looking over their shoulder at each other. And Jesus walks in, not only into that tension, but he looks around, and it's a room full of guys with dirty feet. Because no one has stepped up to do that. And so, so in the context of this intensity and this competition and this, this everyone kind of trying to push themselves up to the top of the heap, um, Jesus walks in. He says, I'll do it. I'll, I'll serve. The other thing that's kind of interesting about all of this is, is kind of the timing of, of how it fits in the story of Jesus. Jesus knew, the, the disciples didn't know, but Jesus knew that this was his last night with them. Out, out of everything that Jesus could embody, could exemplify, anything that he could live out as an example for his followers, he, he would want to do it right then. He would have to get it communicated that night. Now remember, this is, this is the team that after, after the resurrection, after the Holy Spirit shows up, they're going to be responsible for for telling the gospel story and sharing the love of God. They're going to be responsible for helping to, to birth the church. And so, so this is kind of the last time that he's really going to get a chance to pour into them. And, and you know, if you, if you got a chance to, to know when your last words are going to be said, you want to make them, you want to make them um, significant. You want it to be kind of these last important things that you want those around you to know. It's one of his last moments. And so basically, he, he, so what does he do? He serves. He serves and he's saying, boys, if you don't get this, if you don't understand this, if you don't understand the basin and the towel, if you don't understand not racing to the top, but racing to the bottom, if you don't understand this, you're not going to get anything. And so he, he lived it out. There's a story about a, a young man in a, in a country church. He had listened to the pastor for years and, and had decided, well, you know, that's, that's what I want to do. I want to do that. I see, I see the people looking at him and listening to him. He's got this captive audience every week. That, maybe that's something that I want to do. And, and so one Sunday, the preacher was talking about getting involved in, in the church. And so he went to the preacher. He said, I, I want to get involved. I, I want to get the opportunity to preach. And, and so the, the preacher said, well, do you want to be used by God? He said, yes, sir. He said, well, then meet me here this coming Saturday morning at five o'clock. We're going to have prayer together. He showed up and, uh, and, and came into this room, and it was basically these, these five little old ladies sitting in this, in this room with, with, with the aluminum chairs in a circle, and one chair open for him. And so so he, he sat down, and, and as he sat down, the preacher said, now, now listen, young man, uh, if you don't stay committed to this prayer meeting, then, then don't bother coming back to this church and saying that God wants to use you, okay? So, so he, he, he went through this for like five or six months of praying with these, these senior adult women. After six months, the pastor came and said, son, do you still want to be used by God? He's probably a little, little leery of that question, but he said, okay, yeah, yeah, I do. 
He said, I'll, I'll tell you what, meet me this Saturday at nine o'clock. I need your help at the church. You see, the pastor, the pastor knew something. He knew that if the young man didn't learn to serve in, in secret when, when the spotlight wasn't on him, then, then he'd never be any good in public. So, so next week, he showed up on, on Saturday morning at 9 o'clock, and the pastor met him there and, and, and put a vacuum cleaner in his hand. He said, here's what I need you to do. I need you to vacuum this church for the next nine months. Don't miss a single Saturday, because if you do, don't bother coming back to this church and telling me you want to be used by God. Nine months, he vacuumed this church. Started to see the place a little bit differently. When the kids in the middle were, uh, were eating... Uh, Cheez-Its and putting crumbs on the floor. He took it a little more seriously than the time that he was one of those kids doing the same type of thing. He vacuumed the church over and over. But see, the pastor knew something that the young man didn't know at that point. The pastor knew that if he didn't understand how to love and embrace and honor the house of God, that, that he wouldn't be able to speak for God in any way. So after that time came, the, the pastor came to him and said, okay, you are ready to preach now. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to meet me here on Sunday morning. I want you to meet me Sunday morning at 11, and you're going to preach this Sunday, so get ready to preach. Come ready to preach. And so, so he was fired up. He bought, went out and bought a new suit, showed up at church this, that Sunday morning, ready to go. The pastor took him around back, and instead of going to the sanctuary, he took him to one of the little back rooms. And as he opened the door, he saw uh, six 11-year-old boys. And uh, the pastor said, I need you to preach to them for the next 52 weeks. Because if you can't preach for the next 52 weeks to these boys, don't bother coming back to this church saying you want to be used by God. Again, here's what the pastor knew that the young man didn't know. That if he didn't learn to serve who some people would consider insignificant in, in the small, in the areas that nobody really knew about, nobody else really wanted to, then how else would he be able to serve anywhere else? He... That, that pastor knew about the heart of serving. He, he knew that ministry and that the cause of Christ goes forward when we develop the heart of serving. He knew that if the young man didn't understand this heart of serving, that he wouldn't live a blessed life. And if he wasn't living a blessed life, how could he be a good husband if he didn't understand the power of serving? How could he be a good father? How could he ever operate in, in a church, in a Jesus-style leadership, if he didn't understand one of Jesus' most important messages that he had to, to serve others. If, if he didn't have this passion for serving, how could he ever build a church or even before that be a volunteer or be a part of a small group or help people get connected to the cause of Christ if he didn't understand that it's all about serving? I want to ask you um, just a simple question. How, how is your heart of serving? It, is, is it heart beating for the cause of Christ right in line with, with what he wants us to do? That, that's, that, that's a question that kind of comes when we look at this John chapter 13. How is your heart to serve? Is it beating for others? Is it beating for the cause of Christ? Because that's what it's all about. Jesus does a few things in this, in this passage. He gives us some characteristics about a heart of serving. The first thing that he did uh, when, when it jumps into verse uh, 14, or I'm sorry, in, actually in, back in verse, uh, back, verse 4, it says uh, he got up from the table. The, to, to have a heart for serving, you have to be willing to be involved. You have to be willing to take that step. Jesus got involved. Jesus got up from the table. He didn't stay back. He got up. What, what do we learn from this? Well, there's a time to sit at the table. There's a time to get up from the table. Okay, there, there's a time to sit at the table and kind of talk it out. There, there's a time to, 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 to sit at the table and think about it. There's time to sit right here and learn about it. But there's a time to get up from the table. To, to take the, the napkin from around our neck saying, feed me, and put it as an apron around our waist and be ready to get up from the table and serve. To get involved with, with those who are hurting. To get involved with those who are going through tough times. 
Jesus got up and he got involved. He was willing to get up and put legs to what it was that he was saying. I think God wants us to put legs to the love that we say we have for others. When, when, we, when we express our love, when we say, oh, we love you, Port Charlotte, Northport, Punta Gorda, Englewood. We love, we love this area. We love this community. When we say, we love you, neighborhood. When we say, we love you, workplace. Are, are we willing to put our legs into it? To, to get involved, sometimes even with the hard things. The things that are uncomfortable. The things that are, are different from our own experience. Jesus did that. Jesus had the heart of serving. He was willing to get up from the table. So, so he got up from the table, but then what do you have to do to wash their feet? You, you don't expect the guy to lift his foot up over his head so Jesus could do it. What did he do? Jesus stooped down. The Bible says that he, he took that towel, he wrapped it around his waist, he stooped down, he got low, he got down to where their point of need was. It's humility. Jesus, Jesus humbled himself. I mean, can you imagine? God kneeling to, dude, wash your feet. He, he humbled himself. He was washing the feet of his disciples. He was washing those feet that a few hours from now, they would all run in the other direction away from him. And he knew it. But he also knew that after the cross, and after the resurrection, and after grace and mercy, that those feet that ran away from him would eventually be the feet that carried the gospel of love to the ends of the earth. He, he saw where they were at that moment, but he saw beyond that. He saw beyond where they were at that moment. That's a characteristic of a great leader. That's a great um, characteristic to, to, to see in a church. A church that sees people not just where they are, that they're not defined by their problem, that they're not just defined by their failure, not just defined by the issue in their lives, but for us to be able to see beyond that, to see who God created them to be, to, to be able to believe that through the grace and mercy and forgiveness of Jesus Christ, they can go beyond where they are and they can be, begin to live out their God-anointed dreams in their lives. That they can fully understand that God created them and that He loves them and that He has a plan for their life. A lot of times it takes us stepping down into someone's situation so we can let them know that there is hope there is a new beginning. There is a fresh start. There may be some of you here tonight who may be wondering, you know, can there be a fresh start for me? Is there a second chance? Is, is there hope? Even, even with the things that I've done, even with the things that I've been a part of, I'm here to tell you that the, there is a fresh start available. And Jesus was willing to humble himself and go to the cross so that you and I would have an opportunity and you and I could have this new beginning. He stepped down. It, it, was, it was God. We hear this term a lot of times at Christmas time. Emmanuel, God with us. I, I love the thought that Jesus made himself vulnerable. He brought himself low so he could bring us up. The last thing in this scripture, which is a, a great trait when it comes to having this heart of serving and it leads us down that path to the blessed life, is, is he, he took the towel and he let them know that we're not going to be a group that is defined by our bickering and our fighting and our disagreements and our arguing and our worrying about who's doing what, who's going to get what. What we are going to be about is servanthood. What, what I'm going to give you is going to be the towel. Okay, uh, it, it's the texture of the towel. It's not something that's a texture of silk or satin. The texture is something to make you comfortable. I'm giving you the towel. So that you can reach people. So that you can serve. None of this is about me. None of this is about you. Jesus was willing to get messy so he could make a difference in people's lives. 
I think those disciples that night probably never forgot that moment. I mean, here it is. Over 2,000 years later, we're still talking about it. I think it was something that always stayed with them. Per- Peter was the first one to recognize it. He said, oh, Jesus, don't do that. You can't do that. Don't wash my feet. But Jesus was willing to, to stoop down so that he could bring them up. And that shows us that if we have this, this heart of serving, we have to be willing to be involved. We have to be willing to, 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 to stoop down and walk together with people through this heart of servanthood. Because there are people all around us that need to be served. People in all areas of our lives that need to know that they have value, that they have worth. Maybe there are going to be some opportunities for you to get a chance to live this out. To, to reach out to people. It, it's all about Jesus. It's all about the other people. It's not about us. It's about serving others. Jesus himself said, I, I did not come to be served, but to serve. And, and that's what he demonstrated. That's what he lived out to his disciples. That's been part of the, the DNA of this church for a long time. Even when, when this church was located over on Edgewater Drive, there was a heart of, of serving, a willingness to, to reach out to the community. Then God said, okay, I see that spark in you. I'm, I'm going to put it to the test. I'm, I'm going to plop you right down here in the middle of everything. And so in 2001, the Edgewater United Methodist Church moved to this location right here in the middle of everything. And then uh, anybody know what happened in August 2004? Hurricane Charlie ripped through here. Uh, a lot of damage was done. A lot of damage was done to this church. Tons of damage was done to this community. Lives were forever altered. But this church, and God through this church, reached out to the people in this community. I mean, they, they served in so many amazing ways. I hear these stories, and I just bust with, with pride and excitement over, over hearing how this church so willingly said, it's not about us, it's about God, it's about you and people whose own houses were in a shambles were here handing out ice and, and clothing and, and putting a comforting arm around someone else. They were here to serve. And I can imagine God on that day saying to those people, today you represented me. I don't know if you do it every day. But, but today, you cared for the least. Today, you cared for those who have been forgotten. Those who are going through tough times. That, that's, that's my heart. That's my heart to serve. That's what I did for you. And, and that's what He wants to do in everyone's life. To, to do a work in our hearts so that we get the opportunity then to, to, to be able to reach out to those that no one else wants to reach. I think Edgewater can be that place to reach them. There, there's some of us that uh, heard this phrase a few years ago, and we've been praying it uh, periodically, and, and that's praying that, uh, that God would send us people who, who need what we have, and that God would send us people who have what we need. And I, I think He's doing that. It, it doesn't mean that we have a lot of stuff here, because like I said last week, God is pouring into us And we're pouring out into the lives of other people. We've kept that that flow nice and clear. We don't let it get get all clogged up by trying to hang on to things, by trying to to make this an ornate place and and trying to, uh, I mean, man, the carpet and the walls. And and, and we just look around and we just go, but you know, what's really important? There's a verse in Proverbs that says, uh, a clean stall has no oxen. So basically, you're going to have oxen you're going to have oxen mess, okay? If, if you want a clean stall, then just don't put any oxen in there, okay? I think it's the same thing for us here at Edgewater. Dude, we got oxen mess <laughs> all over the place here. <laughs> Some of us are oxen mess, you know? And, and, and so, but God is working through that. And I think God is putting his hand of blessing upon us because we're willing to do that. And, and we need to continue to grow in that way. And we can need to continue to get as many people involved as we can. And not just serving in areas here at the church, but just serving and reaching out in the community in all sorts of ways. 
even in just the, your day-to-day relationships with folks, being willing to, to, to put others' needs ahead of your own so that this heart of serving continues on. One of the things that we're going to do in, in two weeks on Father's Day, uh, we're going to be having a Father's Day weekend, we're going to be having a, a ministry fair. We're going to be having a time when we're all, all the ministries of the church are going to be setting up tables all throughout the, the hallway and the gathering place and the lobby, and they're, they're going to be all over the place. For, to give you an opportunity, if you're not plugged in anywhere or if you're looking for maybe a different place to serve that meets who you are so that God can use the gifts and talents and abilities and experiences that He's given you, and, and we're going to have those here for you to get an opportunity to ask questions and find things out. And, and, and going and talking to someone doesn't mean that you've just signed up for a 10-year term for something. Okay? And go there. Try it. If it doesn't fit, go try something else. We've got, we've got a lot of stuff. And then there's stuff, like I said, even beyond these walls. So, so we all need to develop this heart of serving. Because, because we hear it. We hear, we hear a lot of things. I've got a captive audience here for a half hour every week. You get to hear a lot. But hearing it's not enough. What did Jesus say? You've got to hear it, and you've got to do it. That is the path to blessing. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your heart. Your heart of, of service. This heart that pours out to us. God, we want to have a heart to serve. We want to have a heart patterned after you. God, I ask that you would uh, help us to be your, your hands and your heart and your words. That we'd be willing to get up from the table, put legs to these words that we say. That we would notice what needs to be noticed. That we maybe hear things that other people don't hear. That we'd see what other people don't see. Maybe even about our family, about our community, in, in our church. God, the path of the blessed life is through serving. And God, you, you humbled yourself. You, you stooped down. You took on the towel. You got involved. And God, that's what we want to do as, as individuals and as a church family. God, I pray for every person here today that you would give us a heart that would be enlarged and expanded to serve others. God, help us to to know that it's not about me, myself, and I, but that it's all about you and that it's all about others. And that's when we get the opportunity to live this blessed life. Give us a heart to serve the cause of Jesus Christ every day of our lives. We thank you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
sometimes when we uh, talk about putting the needs of other folks in front of uh, ours, um, sometimes we, we shy away from that because we go, oh man, you know, I don't, I don't want to be a doormat. I don't, I don't, wanna, I don't want people to walk all over me. And, and so, so we, but, but the thing is, is that we're, we're so far over here as, as just people in general, as far as looking at our own needs. That, that we've got a long way before we swing all the way over to, uh, to, to being just totally a doormat. So, so we, we could all stand to swing a, even just a little bit further this way. I, w- I want to encourage you to maybe take some steps this week to, to, to value the other, whether you know them or not, whether, who dare I say, whether you like them or not, value the other. And, and, and show that value. Don't just go, hmm, I value that person. But, but to do something about it. Put some legs to it. Do, do, do something. Even as something as simple as holding a door for someone. Letting someone else have the parking space. Let someone get in front of you in line at the grocery store. Helping someone out with a project at work. Um, taking, bringing your neighbor's garbage cans up to the, their garage door. Uh, what, what, just something. Do, do something this week to, to take that step beyond where, where you normally go. To, to serve because because it doesn't it, serving others and putting other people's needs before your own doesn't make you weak. To me, it takes a strong person to do that. Because to me, it's easy. It's easy for me to be selfish. It's easy for me to walk that path where where it's all about me. But you know, the more I think about it, the more I pray about it, the more I read about it, I don't want to walk that path. I want I want to walk the path to blessing. I want to walk that path that involves giving to others, serving others, loving others. And I just, want to, I just want to encourage you to join me on that journey. So as we close our time tonight, let's stand up. Let's sing together.